Hi, I'm Glenn Russell. Welcome to our program, Exploring the Wonderful Book of Matthew. It's part of the 3 ABN series entitled, The Books of the Book. I'd like you to meet our guest, a uh, teacher, uh, Dr. Ronko Stefanovich. Ronko, you teach at Andrews University Theological Seminary. We're exploring a fascinating book. What draws you to this Gospel of Matthew? You, you've been mentioning how it's one that you've, you've been teaching this for a few years, and does it get old? Does it get to something like, well, you feel you know it all, or are you still discovering new things? Actually, I have been teaching Gospel of Matthew for about 17 years. Mm. And every time when I uh, teach that class, I always something learn from my students. It's a w wonderful book. Of course, every gospel is beautiful yeah. in its own way. It's every part of scripture is oh, that yeah. way, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The more we explore, the more God keeps bringing us new treasures. It's a wonderful gift. Let's begin with prayer as we c continue in our study of scripture. Lord, we ask that you will guide us. We need you to teach us. We cannot know you except that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us. May we treasure this gift of revelation, the revelation of Jesus our Savior through the pages of Scripture. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, Rocco, we have been leading up to this great passage we're going to get into today. We, we've seen Jesus begin his ministry with a baptism, uh, taken into the wilderness and tempted, and then he begins his ministry in Galilee. Now we come to Matthew chapter, 20, uh, chapter 5. Tell us a little bit about this. Uh, it was earlier in our series, um, in introducing the Gospel of Matthew, we saw that the emphasis of the Gospel of Matthew is on the twofold aspect of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry consisted, according to the Gospel of Matthew, in teaching and preaching, mm -hmm. and heal, uh, uh, healing people and helping them in their needs, helping them in a, in a practical way. This is how the Gospel of Matthew is organized. We mentioned that Matthew consists of five major blocks. Mm. And here we are, key, we are dealing with the first major block, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 to 7. Do you remember that um, formula saying, when Jesus finished all these sayings, mm. now Jesus goes to put it into the practice, helping people in their, in their needs. So chapters eight and nine. So we are dealing with that first major block of the book. So five major sections, uh, discourses or teachings and the narratives. Yes. And we're looking at the, the first major teaching section. Major teaching Jesus. Okay. Actually, it's really describing who and what the citizens of the kingdoms are. All right. It'd be good for us to read some of this, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Glenn, before we, we go on. Okay. Uh, in order to make the full meaning of the Sermon Mount, we have something to mention. Uh, that um, so many the readers of the Gospels, they do not realize. Whenever we talk about Sermon on the Mount, it's always Matthew chapters 5 to 7. But not too many readers of the Bible realize that there is also another similar sermon that is actually found, let me go there, that is found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6, okay. verses 20. 249. Uh, many uh, liberal scholars, they say, you see, we have two similar sermons, mm -hmm. but they're quite different. Oh, there's disagreements. Jesus yeah. actually never preached to one sermon. Matthew collected some sayings of Jesus. Luke collected some sayings of Jesus. They made it sermons. Actually, I disagree with that. I would suggest to you, you know, Jesus was a preacher. And Glenn, you are a preacher, I am the preacher. I, I travel, we travel throughout the world. I make one sermon and I don't preach in a, a new place, always new sermon. So many times I repeat my sermon in several, several different, different places. Because it applies. It applies. However, I change a little bit to that. I adjust that sermon to the needs of my audience. Mm -hmm. You see, if Jesus worked for three and a half years, how much is that? It's approximately 1,260 days. How many sermons did Jesus preach? If he <laughs> preached only twice a week, Jesus preached several hundred sermons. Mm -hmm. Evidently, Jesus did not every time preach a new sermon. He would take the sermon that he preached before or, or speech that he made before, and he would repeat it, but apply it to the context of his audience. 
So Matthew and Mark, they contain two different sermons. Similar content, how do we know that? Matthew has three chapters. Mm -hmm. Luke has only 29 verses. But there is something else. If we go to Luke chapter 6, verse 17, it says that when Jesus delivered this speech, he was in the plain. It was not on the mount. On a level place. On yeah. the level place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and there is a difference between. So I believe that Jesus preached on two different occasions similar content. But we should notice something. There is also a basic difference. The question is, why did Matthew choose this long sermon and Luke this shorter sermon? Glenn, you will, you will do it in chapter 5 of Matthew. Okay. I will do it in Luke 6. Just a few things. Is. Can you read chapter 5, verse 3 of Matthew? Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Yes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is in Matthew. The same beatitude... Let's see how it sounds in Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom. What is the basic difference? Something's missing. It's here are those who are poor in spirit. Here are those who are really just, poor. Yeah. Just, just one, one more, more, more item. Can you read verse 6 of Matthew chapter 5? Okay. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. What about verse 21 in Luke? Blessed are you who hunger now. Hmm. What is missing? Righteousness. You see, when Jesus preached to the Gentiles, according to the Gospel of Luke, he cared about their physical needs. Mm -hmm. When he preached to those Pharisees, etc., and, and the, uh, the Jews, he cared about their spiritual needs. That's why we need both the sermons. We need both for balance, don't we? I will tell the, the viewers, as we are going through the Sermon on the Mount, you will say, boy, my, my needs are not spiritual. I'm faithful to God. I love God so much. But nobody knows when I come home, I don't have money to pay my electricity. My power will be cut off. Or doctors told me a few days ago that I have few more weeks to live, etc. I need something. There is a Savior. God meets with people where they are. When, when people have needs, mm -hmm. Jesus comes to them and addresses the personal needs that, that, that they have. All right. So Jesus preaches in Matthew 5 yes. a Sermon on a Mount. Yes. What should we know about this? Actually, both in Luke and Matthew, both sermons, they begin with special section. We call them the Beatitudes. Why the Beatitudes? because there are eight sayings, mm -hmm. and each saying begins with one single word, which is in our English translation, blessed. Glenn, would you, would you read those Beatitudes? And by the way, Beatitudes, it's kind of a made-up word, isn't it? Actually, we'll come to that. Okay. After the reading, okay. we'll sure. like to, to Matthew chapter that. 5, verse yeah. 1. Actually, 1 to, to 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he had seated his disciples, came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Until Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay. So we see we have eight sayings. Mm -hmm. Each one begins with the word blessed in English. And I hope that readers will understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, all those who are bilingual, they know that sometimes when you try to translate something from one language to another, there are no words mm -hmm. that they fit. So sometimes you have to use one sentence in order to explain that, that word. In Greek, in we, the language in which the Gospel of Matthew was written, actually contains the word makarios, which is translated as the word blessed. Mm -hmm. Another alternative word for the word makarios um, is happy. By the way, usually English-speaking people uh, uh, 
don't know that in English, we have standard English word, which is called makarism, that comes from the Greek word mak makarius. Makarism simply means happiness. But we really have to understand the, uh, the, the, the root of this word. Mm. Among ancient Greeks, the word makarios meant that the person was spare of all hardships of life. Mm. And here is the, is the point. When a person had a happy family, good bank account, I mean, money was rich, when everything went good in this life, ancient Greeks would say, you see, this person is Makarios. The good life. Good life. This is among ancient Greeks. Mm. What did we notice here in the <laughs> Sermon on the Mount? Who are those who are Makarios? Um, you'll forgive me, I'm using the word Makarios in order to get the, 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 the full sense of, of, of the meaning of this word. They're not spared. Those who are hungry and yes. thirsty, Luke, or, mm -hmm. or righteousness, those who are poor, those po who are persecuted, those who are. Mm. Glenn, let me ask you a question. I would like to ask viewers just to start for a moment to think. Was Jesus unrealistic? Glenn, would you, would you be, be honest with me? When, when you don't have money to pay your bills, do you say, I am blessed? We would call that kind of person out of touch. Actually, they are attendants. Upside down. I never seen a student who does not have money to pay his tuition and he must leave university. No, I, I don't think and, we rejoice in our, our poverty very much. And he say, and he, but you see, the Christians are so many times unre unrealistic, you know. You know, I'm blessed because I'm poor. Did you hear anybody to say, you know, doctor told me I have a few more weeks to live. I'm so much blessed. <laughs> so what is that that Jesus tried to say here with these Beatitudes? Did Jesus try to be unrealistic to say those people who are hungry, who are thirsty, people who are poor, people who suffer hardship of his life, they're blessed. This is not what Jesus tried to say. Actually, if you really want to translate these Beatitudes from original Greek, it should be you are blessed or you are happy despite the fact mm. that you are poor, that you are hungry, that you are pursuing, does make difference. You are not blessed because you are poor. You are blessed despite the fact that you are poor, that you are hungry, that you, that you face the difficulties of this life, and it makes difference. So you have a joy despite what happens to you. Yes. So what is the point that Jesus tried to make? When we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, when we are accepted by God, when we become God's children, God never promised to us mm -hmm. that we will be spared of hardships of life. God never told us that he will take us out of the difficulties of, la of life. What God promised to us is, Jesus said, in the world mm -hmm. you will have tribulation. Is that what Jesus said? That's right. What God promised to us, when we have to go through the difficulties and hardships of life, God will be with us. Not that he will take us out of that. He will be walking with us through the difficulties of life. As the Psalm said, even if I have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will with me. Knowing that God is with me will make me blessed. Give me the assurance that I am not forgotten, that I am not forsaken by God, that God is with me. The external circumstances will not define my relationship with God. My relationship with God will define the circumstances in, we, in which we are. Ronke, you've, you've raised some questions yes. in my mind. We've got to come back to you right after our break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Hans Diehl. Did you know that it is not natural for blood pressure levels to go up as we get older? But that's not the American way. By the time we're 50 years of age, our chance of high blood pressure are 60%. And by the time we're 70 years of age, it's more than 80%. And with that, we have to be concerned about vascular problems that can affect our hearts and minds, our eyes and ears. A major contributor to this hypertension epidemic is our Western diet, which contains 10 to 15 times more salt than the body really needs. As a result, some people have banned their salt shakers totally unaware. 
fact that 80% of our salt is found in processed and fast foods. My health tip for today is this. Yes, ban the salt shaker, but also become more aware of the salt content in processed and fast foods. Become a label reader, make better choices for better health and for lower blood pressure. We're back exploring the Gospel according to Matthew. We're in chapter 5, looking at the Beatitudes. Take us on from where we've been, Ronco. So we understood so far that actually the word makarios, mm. which means a blessed, refers to the people who have difficulties in this life, but telling them they are not blessed because they have the difficulties. They are blessed because they know God, they follow God, God is with them during those difficulties. So despite of the difficulties, Glenn, what is that that make a person happy in this life? Our relationships mainly. Actually, are the external circumstances. No. The external circumstances, they make us happy. Well, temporarily. But, but they make us happy. Yeah, okay. I meet the student there on the campus and he say, Prof, boy, I'm happy person. What happened? I found that lady. Mm -hmm. He's happy, external circumstances. After a few days, he bows the head. He was there on the campus. She kicked you out of, of her life. <laughs> said, yes. He becomes sad. You see, the person is healthy. He's happy. He gets sick. So usually the external circumstances define our happiness. Right. But according to Jesus, the Christians are always happy. The Christians always feel close to God, not because of the external circumstances, but because what God did, does within them. They get that gift, which I call the gift of Makarios, that blessedness, that define their happiness, which is not based on the external circumstances. So uh, when we say happy, we're really having to redefine it. I'm, I'm talking about human view. happiness. Yes, yes. I'm not talking about the joy, that inner joy. You see, human happiness is defined by circumstances of life. Life takes it. Mm -hmm. It gives it and takes. Gives, uh, gives, gives and takes. But when we have Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, Jesus said, I'm giving you this joy, Gospel of John chapter 13, and nobody and nothing will be able to take the joy from you. Now, Ronco, I hear some folks today suggesting what they've been suggesting for a long time, that if you just give your life to Jesus, if you just follow Him or some other formula, you're not going to have any problems. Does the Sermon of the Mount speak to this, this issue of, of believing that you know, if I just follow God, then everything's going to go good. I'll have all the money in the bank. I'll have no problems in my life. Is that what it's about? Do you remember when we go to the, to the Old Testament? God said through Moses to the people of Israel, you'll always have poor people mm -hmm. among yourself. Not because those people deserve it. It's simply because of the circumstances of, of life. Um, we saw Paul, Paul, he started preaching gospel, the gospel, and he was helping poor, poor people. Poverty is not a token of unfaithfulness to God. Poverty can be as a result of many circumstances in this, in this life. But you see, life can take money from you. Um, um, life can take health from me. Life can take many things from me. Mm -hmm. There is one thing that life cannot take from me, what God gives, that inner joy, that, that, that the blessedness that actually um, warms my heart and makes me to move on through this life. You're implying that there can be a condition and then there's kind of a reward. There's kind of two parts to these Beatitudes, aren't there? Yeah. There's your condition, your, your situation in life, yeah. but then there's a promise. Yeah. Beautiful promises. Here. We have to understand that we live in this life when there is a sin. Tragedies, they, they, they uh, very often can strike human, human life. And there is one mystery that I really do not understand. Why sometimes God answers somebody's prayers and people are healed. Mm. People can um, um, tell those great experiences with God. But sometimes God uh, um, does not react. One of the classical examples are when we go to the book of Acts, chapter 12. You, you know, when we read in chapter mm -hmm. 12, mm -hmm. Herod decided to persecute the church and he arrested James. Glenn, who was, who was James? Leader of the church there, one of the three disciples. One of the three disciples, very close group, group to Jesus. And Herod kills him. Yeah. Then, in order to please uh, the Jews, he arrested Peter. What happened with Peter? 
The angel of the Lord comes there to the prison mm. and rescues Peter from the prison. Why Peter was rescued and James was killed? Did God love Peter more than James? Mm. All of, both of them were one of the three yes. disciples. I know from my personal life how God did miracle in the life of our own son and the pastor who prayed for us actually after healing my son just the fifth day after, after the tragic accident of my son, actually he died a tragic, tragic death. Mm. There are many mysteries of this life and, and the question is when we face difficulties of this life according to the Sermon on Mount, it's not to ask what did I uh, sin to God? Did God forsake me, etc. No, only the question we are asking God, come be close to me. And God promised, even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, He will be with us and He will not forsake us. What else would you want us to hold on to from, uh, we could explore each beatitude, we don't have time for that. They're very rich very and powerful, but what should we keep in mind for this sequence? Actually, I want two things is, the beatitudes are eight in the numbers. Yeah. The first four, the Beatitudes, um, the ones I just... Uh, let blessed me. are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, Lord, blessed are the meek, blessed are those just, who hunger. They deal on the vertical level with regard to our relationships with God. The last four, those who are merciful, pure in heart, peacemaker and persecuted, they deal on our relationships on the horizontal level with human beings. Mm. Is that what the Ten Commandments are all about? Sure seems like it. Is that what Jesus, what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart mm -hmm. and love your neighbor as yourself. Actually everything, all the law and the prophets are about our relationships with God and our relationships with human beings. That's actually what Macarius is, is all about, that blessedness that we receive from God. But there is something else. Jesus concludes this beatitude section with verses 13 to 16 and Glenn, I'd like to ask you if you can read these, these verses. And just before I read, I would want to say that when we enter into the beatitudes, we hear Jesus preaching, His values and His attitudes are radically different than this world. We don't say anybody poor is blessed. He has taken a radical approach. This is a completely different understanding of life. And he's here dealing with the citizens of the kingdom. Yes. So those who are in the church, the, cit the citizens of this kingdom, because the church, as we mentioned, is the visible manifestation of the kingdom. This is how the Christians live. While the entire world is complaining about the economy, about everything, you know, the Christians, their happiness is not defined, but what is going in the world is by their relationship with God. So let's read about how he describes those Please, who are the kingdom too much people. Time, yes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it, it is good then for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city that is hit, set on a hill cannot be hidden. Up to 16. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, we have here two metaphors, and I heard people are talking about these metaphors uh, in different contexts, but we have to put in the context of these beatitudes here. What is salt that, and light. What is that Jesus tried to say? Salt. What is the purpose of salt? Glenn, we know that salt always changes the taste of food. Mm. Food never changes the taste of of salt. salt. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus does not say here, you are salt of the world. He says, you are the salt. In Greek, it's a definite article. We are not any salt. The Christians are salt. The Christians, they can make difference in the environment where, where, where they live. So, Jesus here talks about people who are blessed, those who are makarios. Mm -hmm. What is that? Telling them the external circumstances will not change your relationship with God. Your relationship with God will impact and influence the circumstances within which you are. This is the purpose of this first metaphor. All right. Now we have the second metaphor, and this is very significant. People think that Jesus simply repeats the first metaphor. No, he's not doing that. He says, you are the light of the world. Glenn, what is the purpose of light? Obviously, contrasting with darkness. Darkness. But let me ask you one question. I, I'm putting you here on the spot. Does dark impact Darkness, does darkness impact light? It can't destroy it. But can it impact light? 
Let me tell you, when I was a young pastor, you know, I had uh, those old cars. Uh, when you uh, leave the car, you have to be sure that the lights are off. Yeah. Otherwise, it empty the batteries. And I, it, it, uh, in, the, in the morning, I will come to the church. It was sunshine in the summer, you know. I will leave my car and run to the church because I had to preach. And the people tell me, Pastor, the lights are on on the car. No, I said, it's not. They said, it is. I will come there to the car and look. Oh, yes, the lights are on. I will turn, uh, mm -hmm. turn the lights off. But then I will come in the evening. It was dark outside. I did not have need of anybody to tell me that, that the lights are on. Even if I would be far away from my car, I would see that the lights are on. What is the point? Does darkness impact light? Yes. The more dense darkness is, the more visible light is. Does make sense? It's not only that Christians, they change the circumstances. The more severe circumstances are, more visible the presence of God is in their life. I just want to go quickly. She was like my mother, ma mother, mother to me. Uh, uh, she would always give me advice. I was a young pastor. And one day, one day, um, um, uh, her son came to me to tell me that his mother was sick. The doctors told her just that she had a few weeks to live. Mm -hmm. And he asked, can you go and visit her? I went there and she really said, and uh, to make a long story short, I would come every week to visit her. She was so dear to me. And finally I came and I saw a skeleton there on the, on the bed. And the number of people, people there, there, there sitting in, in the room. And there was one lady said, you know, you served your God for about um, 40 years. Why did God allow you all these things now to happen to you? And I saw that skeleton trying to straight to say a few words to her neighbor. And I helped her, you know, quickly. And she said, you know, I served my God for 40 years. He was, he has always been good to me. Mm. I don't know why all these things are taking place with, with me, but I know that my God has not forsaken me. Mm. I will very soon fall asleep. One day my God will stand on the tomb, my tomb, and call me by name. Then you will die after me. <laughs> are you sure that one day your God will stand on your tomb and call you by name? After that, I had evangelistic series. Two of those ladies, hmm. they decided to be baptized. Amen. You see, more dense darkness hmm. is, more visible that light as a, resu as a result of that gift that God gives to us make us to go through this life, it's more visible to people. Your uncle, the world's getting pretty dark. What should we hold on to? Yes. Dear viewers, if in this life you face different difficulties, the problems of this life, I'd like to invite you to put your life into the hands of Jesus Christ and He will define your happiness and journey through this life.